Hi, hello. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the final day of democratic socialism in global perspective, an international conference organized by the Transnational Institute and the Heaven's Bright Center for Social Justice. This can be your first session, special welcome. And this can be your 10th session. In between for many of you, all welcome and thanks for joining us. I hope the previous sessions have been inspiring and stimulating for your thinking and activism. My name is Satoko Kishimoto from Transnational Institute with Daniel Chavez and other colleagues. We run the Public Alternatives Project in the Economic Justice Program. I will be serving as a moderator for this session. In meantime, I would like to give a big, big thank to Lala, Isabel, and Liz for providing a fantastic translation throughout the conference and making it possible for many people to participate. Special uh, remark uh, for Lala, she's going to speak actually as a, a panelist today and has been working extremely hard. I really um, uh, send um, deep sympathy and I hope you are not too, you must be tired, but I hope still you can be with, with us. So this is the last session of today and the whole, con whole a week conference. It is titled Eco-Socialist, uh, Ex-Socialist Strategies to the, to the Safe Planet. I am very excited by the brilliant group of people whom we, we have brought together for this panel. I will introduce each speaker in the more detail before they speak, but for now, I just want to uh, mention their names to welcome and thank to join this session. Lala Peñalanda, Belan Horvath, and Sean Sweeney. Before providing a full introduction, I would like to give over a format briefly of this session. Each panelist will, uh, will be given 20 minutes. After that, we will have 60 minutes for discussion. You can share your questions throughout the session via the Q&A button at the bottom of screen. I will also invite questions and contributions from other conference panelists who will be speaking during uh, other parts of the conference. So I ask you to be prepared to come in after the pa panelists who have, who have finished speaking. Okay, I hope everything is clear as uh, the same as other uh, sessions. Let's go. I would like to say a few words as the introduction. I feel the conference conveners, Paige, uh, Patrick and Daniel, strategically put this session at the end of the conference. I hope all, uh, all the thematic priorities of this conference will come together and to be further concretized. The urgency of the climate crisis cannot be stressed enough today. Scientists of the IPCC warned that the world in 2100 will be no longer recognizable unless we commit to a radical change by 2030. The countdown has begun and we have only 10 years to avoid, avoid a catastrophe. The climate crisis forces all of us to do radical rethinking and um, bring this into practice with a great speed. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Lala Peñalanda. Lala is, the, is a socialist and a feminist activist born in Colombia, working on labor, climate, and the Latin American politics and economics with the Trade Union for Energy Democracy Global Network, it's called TUIT, and the International Committee of the Democratic Socialist of America. TUIT has played a strategic role in alliance building among unions with other climate justice movements, 
it connect it connects 82 trade unions from 25 countries including global union federations regional organizations and the international centers lala will speak about eco socialist strategies in latin america and particularly colombia in particular all right so this presentation will actually relate to some points that my co-panelist Sean Sweeney will allude to, but I will be locating some eco-socialist arguments within the context of Latin America and Colombia in particular. In a region where the left is characterized by radical resource nationalism on the one hand and anti-extractivism on the other, although of course it is more complex than such a simple binary. A critical question is what is the role of trade unions in the development of energy transition programs? How do trade unions just transition demands relate to calls for commonizing the state as we've heard over and over again in this conference? I will begin with a regional characterization of the debate followed by a brief overview of examples of TUED's incipient but urgent work in Latin America. I'll then narrow down on Colombia, where I am from, and focus on the just transition organizing work being done between unions, municipalities, social movements, focusing, of course, on unions. Lastly, I will outline some similarities with just transition demands of other unions in other Latin American countries and the shared tasks ahead. So first, a uh, regional characterization. As many panelists in this conference have argued, Latin America has seen left administrations, to use the term left, enter and leave office with varying degrees of success. Jeff Weber's characterization of the periods of uh, proceeding and after the pink tide uh, through today is particularly useful in this analysis. To me, it is clear that the compromises the pink tide governments made with global capital and their ushering of new forms of left populist neoliberalization have had concrete impacts on just transition debates today in the region. The pink tide years of government characterized by radical resource nationalism heightened, this is important, and radicalized resource politics. As such, the study of this period in the context of both energy democracy, i.e. something that goes beyond energy sovereignty, but includes it, and a climate crisis on the other hand is important for the development of energy policies in the years ahead. I won't go into detail into these characterizations, but it for now suffices to say that I agree with the characterization and lessons outlined by Jeff Weber in his presentation at this conference. I'd also just like to mention Theo Rio Francos's uh, deeper characterization of focusing on Ecuador, what radical resource nationalism entailed, both its victories and its pitfalls. Um, and she likewise characterizes anti-extractivist lefts, which again are not necessarily in opposition. It is more, I think, of um, an exchange of priorities. Trade unions to varying degrees in each country and sector and are uniquely positioned to contain and address these tensions. For proposals to reach their objectives, it is clear, as Sean has argued and may argue today, that we need something more than nationalized energy. We need something more than public energy. The question of the state is central to energy transition, as in the case of, for example, ESCOM in South Africa or Sintram Cali in Colombia, and as many others have demonstrated. Daniel Chavez uh, in this conference has also offered useful frameworks for commonizing the state and building public-public partnerships in Latin America for public services. These approaches to the state are particularly important in a region where ideas of community energy are extremely popular, both within and outside of unions. Community energy projects are interesting as political projects, 
um, and I have friends that are involved in these projects who I greatly respect, but they fall short of providing or addressing the requisites, both in terms of the scale, coordination and urgency of the imperatives of what we would need for an energy transition. Tuad has written working papers about the limitations of community energy proposals that I think are extremely valuable to this debate. So what do the conclusions outlined by Tuad imply regarding large scale and centralized energy planning for the just transition movements in the region? I'll, work, I'll talk a little bit about Tuad's work in Latin America. As I mentioned, it's incipient but important in working through the technical challenges of decarbonization with unions while simultaneously advancing the arguments for a public approach to energy transition that rejects the logic of growth imperatives. During the Global Trade Union Assembly of 2020, which TU had helped to coordinate, Latin American unions played an active role in sharing their organizing experiences in public energy, the democratization of finance, informal sector organizing, anti-austerity coalitions, and other issues in response to the multi-layered crises of corona, climate, and inequality. In December, TUA had held one of its periodic global forums, this time focused on Latin American proposals for a just transition, and those recordings are online. Uh, the Global Forum focused on the experiences of Brazil, Uruguay, and Mexico. And at the end of the day, I think one of the most useful contributions of TUED to just transition um, work in Latin America are twofold. First, the internationalism in practice, right? There are exchanges between unions on lessons from just transition struggles. South Africa in communication with Puerto Rico, Chile in communication with South Korea, Brazil with Tunisia, and so on. Many of the details in each country are not translatable, of course, but global capital makes it such that green growth solutions are imposed the world over. Likewise, for example, the Australian ownership of a mine in Colombia may be an opening for solidarity between workers of the corporation in Australia and the mine workers in Colombia. Similarly, the OECD uh, imposes uh, very similar requirements in global South countries across the world. So we can work with those pressures. You get the idea. There are local struggles, multinational capital, capital and global supply chains at stake. And we have a lot to gain from communication and coordination. The second, um, I think, big contribution is the advising um, to unions on the political, this is important, the political implications and the political nature of, for example, as I mentioned, the technical elements of decarbonization. As Sean will maybe explain, the technical is political. Unions have the political intuition. They stand by anti-capitalist politics, while at the same time, unfortunately, sometimes propping up neoliberal solutions to the climate crisis. This may be because of conservative leadership, possibly, or because, and I think this is more probable, they believe there is an absence of viable alternatives. Advising therefore often means spelling possible paths beyond a dichotomy of state or communal, environment or workers' rights. It's really all of the above and with certain qualifications that meet the country's energy landscape. Again, to Daniel's point, the question for energy transition for the left is not to be statist or be, to be autonomous, but rather how to build a public ownership of energy with democratic control, how to create public-public partnerships, again, how to democratize or communize the state. Yes, worker ownership of energy and other public companies, but what else? So here I'm going to look at Colombia. I think a close look at Colombia as a case study sheds light on how social movements and trade unions have been working together, though not always in complete agreement, to replace neoliberal extractivist logic, the kind of logic that places 63 private renewable energy projects just in the department of Guajira in the Caribbean coast. 
that replaces that logic with debates about resource nationalism and the commons. I will look at the proposals of first leading unions in Colombia, secondly, the Mesmea por la Paz, I'll get into that, third, very briefly, municipalities, and fourth, leading social movements. And I think I'm um, a little over time at this point, so I may just choose some unions to highlight. The unions I have met with um, through to it include Sintra Carbon, the carbon union, Sintra Elecol, electricity workers, Sintra M Cali, public services of Cali, Uso, the petroleum workers union, and CUT Colombia, the national, the largest national worker center, among others. From my experience, Colombia is the country with the most active trade union movement in just transition programs. Of course, I'm not objective. My first political experiences were with agrarian movements, and even then they were talking about the role of agriculture and land reform in just transition programs. But I see constant dialogue between unions. The most recent meeting between unions on this topic was just one month ago in December of 2020, and they have their conclusions on the Sintra Carbon website but it was all the unions I mentioned and more that sat down and agreed on a sort of manifesto. I'm going to speak for reasons of time about USO, which is the Petroleum Workers Union that I feel inspired by every day. Edwin Palma is the current president and in 2006, Alvaro Uribe, our former paramilitary president, announced that 20% of Ecopetrol would be sold off. Why? To guarantee financial autonomy, supposedly. Similar experiences um, have been, or similar privatization schemes have been imposed on, for example, Avianca, the airline company that Colombia um, used to have. Between 2006 and 2019, the announcement of Alvaro Uribe materialized today 80% of Ecopetrol, the petroleum uh, company, is in the public's hands and 20% is privatized. USO, the petroleum union, has been invited as a token guest to so many of the right-wing administration's self-applauding presentations where more political will is called upon um, and summoned, but where ultimately the focus is on Paris Agreement and uh, oriented towards investment and growth. The USO has insisted that Colombia must resist a shock doctrine, i.e. that looking at, for example, um, the experiences of regions such as Casabe and Tibú, where petroleum production abruptly ended after decades of complete dependence, have caused economic devastation. We need to have unions, Uso says, involved at the national, regional, and local planning secretaries and ministries. Oil accounts for 12% of the state's resources to function. If there were dramatic cuts, it would justify austerity measures, although petroleum production has been on the rise in recent years. So USO's proposal, much like ESCOM in South Africa, is to take back Ecopetrol. It's not enough to make it public, but if Ecopetrol doesn't lead the energy transition, who will? Large multinationals, they say. We must defend and simultaneously transform from within Ecopetrol and CENIT, which is the gas and petroleum sister company. Yes, we need political pressure we need a left in politics to keep Ecopetrol public. It has been, uh, Ecopetrol has been developing solar energy projects, for example, in Meta, but it requires large scale investment and centralized planning with knowledge about the territories, so with decentralized knowledge, to realize these projects. USO has also proposed uh, laws, uh, bills that would use Ecopetrol funds to create an energy transition fund um, to finance retrainments, uh, retraining of workers, early pensions, and uh, public renewable energy. 
I wanted to talk about Sintra Carbon as well because they're phenomenal. They're the carbon union. Colombia is one of the world's largest uh, carbon exporters, but uh, I think for reasons of time, I will uh, continue to talk about um, the Mesa Social Minor Energetica um, por la Paz, which is a joint effort between a pro over 80 unions, social movements, municipalities, energy companies, and politicians. Um, how many minutes do I have? Uh, six. Six, excellent. Six, five. So the Mesa Minero Energetica is consciously and markedly different from what other panelists have called the laundry list of radical promises. Um, with that term, they have been referring to a list of radical demands that is at the same time a bit incredulously received by voters um, because of the absence of the actual capability to transform the state and enact or realize those promises. When you look at the list of demands of the Mesa Minero Energetica, again, this broad coalition for just transition, you can say, well, anyone could have written up those demands. But the important element here is the political rank and file training behind the demands. This is the product of two years of popular assemblies across the country focusing in oil rich regions. This is a process that positions unions squarely in a legitimacy of social leadership in their popular consultation of energy demands and needs locally and uh, nationally. The Mesa Minero Energetica is also unique in its direct line of communication, as I mentioned, with left and progressive Congress people. La Banca de Oposición, the left slate, is supportive and participates in La Mesa Minero Energetica, attending their meetings. So a, tri or a, a coalition is formed between social movements, energy companies, energy unions, and the progressive slate or the left slate of uh, politicians in power. I don't have time to talk about municipalities, but I would like to point out that Cali through the union Sintra in Cali is an extremely important experience to look at. I would also recommend Wilson Arias and uh, the lessons that Gustavo Petro, who was the left leaning mayor of Bogota and um, a staunch proponent of energy transition left us. He had a great relationship with the energy unions and um, the energy unions definitely educated in, in him in how to talk to unions and uh, rank and file members about energy transition, centering worker concerns um, at the center, right? I'll also say about the municipalities that armed conflict has played a role in politicizing energy in very particular ways to the Colombian context. My dad worked at the Ministry of the Environment when the guerrilla group LN was bombing the oil pipelines to disrupt business as usual in Putumayo. Power lines were simul similarly frequent targets. That is to say the critical infrastructure of energy has always been contested. And um, we have to study how the armed conflict has impacted these debates. Um, I think I'll talk about some of the social movements um, in the Q&A, but I do wanna talk and just mention that the anti-militarization movement in Colombia is extremely important to these debates because of the mass scale of the military budget. Um, also, as I mentioned, the campesino movement through uh, calls for agrarian reform and Congreso de los Pueblos, which is a coalition of movements that includes as one of its spokespeople, the president or the executive director rather of the um, CUT Colombia. I guess I will wrap up with, um, and I can mention in the Q&A a few lessons that I've learned from other unions in the region, but I just want to summarize the three points of my presentation. First, unions in Colombia are in a unique position there is a tension, as I mentioned, often talked about between radical resource nationalism and anti-extractivism. It is in the interest of unions to attend to both of the important points raised by um, each of these sides. 
it is a difficult balance, but unions are strategically positioned to um, address them. Unions are tend to be extremely proud of the material, they, they know the material reality of the energy infrastructure. They know about the social relationships in energy plants and between sectors and are proud to fight for public control, for union rights, for access to energy. And yet they do, and they are invested in a sustainable environment, uh, also in terms of labor. They wanna transition and they wanna plan and prioritize frontline workers. And then, in one minute, I will uh, communicate the last two takeaway points. The first is that unions need support. They need left infrastructure, research, rank and file education. And I think Comuna in Uruguay is a great example of that. It tends to be the case that the unions most advanced in just transition platforms tend to be the ones with uh, think tanks to help them in research. And then lastly, unions need to be democratized from within. There is um, racism and sexism and centralized decision making that I think, um, from my experience, often hinders the more radical elements of energy transition demands from within unions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lala. That was a brilliant start of the session. You bring brought us so many concrete, you know, the real uh, real reality of the strategy, multiple strat political strategies, not only unions and multiple coalition. That was really, really impressive for just transition from Colombian perspective. So let's move on. Uh, the, I would like to introduce next uh, speaker, Pedro Hobet. Bedolan is a managing director of the Institute for Political Eco Ecology in Croatia. From 2005 to 2015, he was the country director of the Zaglav office of Heinrich Paul Stephen Stiftung, a German Green Political Foundation. Since 2012, he has been the national correspondent of Green European Journal. Until 2004, he works as a journali journalist and web editor in the daily political newspaper, Vesnik. He's a sociologist specialized on human rights, regularly publishing on European politics, civil society development, environmental issues. Bedran will speak about democratic ownership and commons-based governance in achieving climate neutrality. At a to certain extent, I think uh, the Bedran will build up what the Lala, Lala presented to us. I also uh, have proposed to Bedran to address or deepen perhaps the, the, the point that Titi Battachalia uh, mentioned in the previous session a few days, few days back. She argued that just transition has to be anti-capitalism. How can the eco-socialist strategy or socialist Green New Deal strive for degrowth decarbonization. Bedran, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Satoko. Uh, many thanks for invitation. Uh, I'm happy to be here with all panelists and organizers. And so uh, let me start without further ado. Uh, I would like, uh, as Satoko announced, to focus uh, my intervention uh, on the eco-socialist strategies uh, with focus on uh, de democratizing uh, and commons-based uh, power that they might, uh, they had, they can hold within. Uh, but before that, uh, I would like us to start maybe with one image. Uh, let us imagine now uh, children of the age of Greta Thunberg and Fridays for Future uh, generation in three decades time, uh, what will happen with them when they will, they will be 2050? Will they be happy? Will they be satisfied? Will they be resignated, furious? Uh, how they will look back to uh, these years in which we are discussing uh, climate emergency? Uh, how they will uh, reflect on this momentum? Did we do enough? And if we didn't, what prevented us? 
what is left to be done uh, if uh, there are se severe obstacles uh, for uh, moving much more courageous and more uh, aggressive with uh, uh, bold climate measures? And uh, more or less, I think that the basic questions I would like to address here is what left has to do with it and how left can uh, in integrate uh, some of the solutions uh, in these regards. Climate emergency movements, uh, even if they made considerable success recognized by institutions like some cities or municipalities, they still appear to be uh, they appear to be to failing to be a threat for capitalism, uh, at least not a threat difficult to be managed, uh, as very often they are caught in trap of deliberative discourse, uh, which apparently is not disruptive enough for business as usual. And if they not, uh, if they do not appear to be uh, uh, to caught be caught in this trap they on the other hand appear to be very militant just like a recently released book by andreas Malm, how to blow up a pipeline that was just released a few days ago so uh, i think that uh, we could go forward with uh, in this discussion to finding ways how how left can maybe uh, find uh, a middle way uh, between uh, these these extremes uh, and I think that main concern uh, uh, for the eco-socialist strategies uh, uh, which are dealing with uh, saving the planet goal is how to uh, ensure that we can find ways to have a good life and good life for all uh, and not a life reduced to misery uh, in, the, in the planet that is facing environmental collapse which very often seems to be true, uh, particularly in some regions. I would start like with three main, uh, let, let's say backbones of the eco-socialist strategies I find relevant uh, uh, to be involved in this debate. Uh, first and most apparent is that any eco-socialist strategy that aims to uh, be long-term oriented and uh, be resilient should try to find ways to reduce or to diminish conflict between those political and social forces that are working uh, actively for our labor uh, rights, for uh, a quality of labor, decent work conditions, uh, and on the other side, uh, defending or protecting ecosystems. Uh, I think this is the most important uh, dimension is not to get lost or trapped uh, in this uh, very often artificial conflict in which only uh, the capital and capitalism gains profits from. Secondly, uh, I would say that uh, it is most important to envision economy starting from today, if not yesterday, under ecological limits, under planetary boundaries, and paired with, of course, the goal of reducing social inequalities. I think these two dimensions are uh, most important to be uh, a consisting part of any eco-socialist strategy, particularly uh, under these conditions, uh, framing uh, ground for degrowth economy. Uh, economy that is uh, decoupled from uh, orientation, growth uh, orientation and uh, profit accumulation, and which is uh, actually reconsidering uh, at very fundamental level, what is sufficient, what is sufficient for us to have a good life. Uh, and of course, uh, you can already imagine very easily, it is very often and most importantly, focused on reduction of consumption. What requires a broader cultural change uh, our societies needs to be part of. Third uh, point would be, of course, uh, already announced by Satoko is uh, a state or 
public uh, dimension, uh, which requires uh, commons-based principles uh, and democratic ownership to be part of any eco-socialist strategy. Uh, that primarily uh, implies uh, finding ways to increase citizen or civic control uh, over the uh, public companies, uh, primarily in the field of public services, like energy, water, waste, uh, transport. Uh, it can be also extended to other uh, realms. Uh, of course, to already mentioned uh, uh, public civic partnerships or public public partnerships, uh, co governance or collaborative models uh, that uh, could uh, uh, finish the hierarchical top down approach by state to uh, offer uh, services under unfavorable uh, uh, conditions or uh, uh, with uh, severe economic losses, which are often the case in some of the regions. So uh, I think that there is urgency uh, for the left to find ways to take over public companies and use them to initiate uh, commonizing the project of commonizing the state and commonizing the public, uh, which we mentioned already many times last years. Uh, I, I, I would like to remind here that uh, public sphere and particularly domain of the public services, uh, very often uh, managed by state is, uh, I would say, uh, a fertile ground and terrain to start uh, the project of communization of the state. Uh, as it brings uh, commons as a sort of constituent power uh, of the new, uh, let's say, counter power that can challenge uh, top down hierarchical structures of the state, very often imposed by uh, right or center right political parties. Uh, I would say that eco socialist strategies uh, uh, would need to be based on at least uh, seven points, uh, which I find uh, uh, as a, some sort of fr framework, very important framework for uh, for uh, defining uh, eco-socialist agenda and in this momentum, but of course, by no way limited to these points. Uh, and I would uh, like to name them and maybe say a couple of sentences for each. Uh, so eco-socialist agenda, it could be, uh, are a mixture, a hybrid uh, uh, strategy of uh, of seven points. One is, of course, uh, focused on the commons-based governments. Second would be a degrowth orientation. Uh, third would be feminist. Fourth would be internationalist. Five would be local. Six would be disobedient and seven would be anti-capitalist. As you can imagine, many of these in, uh, are converging. There are probably uh, uh, some uh, elements missing that relate to certain ways of oppression that exist uh, in some uh, regions or parts of the planet. Uh, but these seven is the one, uh, are those which I would like to start with. Uh, Commons uh, are extremely important uh, as, as a way of involving or uh, introducing back uh, uh, some of the most important principles of self-organization that are present in eco-socialism literature uh, and in some probably, let's say, even anarchist uh, literature uh, uh, where we, we can see commons as a, a inspiration and also very practical tool to uh, introduce self-organization at a local uh, or let's say municipal level uh, where we can uh, involve citizen interests and needs to much larger extent uh, and uh, use them as a counter power to negotiate and challenge uh, rigid uh, and scrutinized structures and procedures performed by the state and also used in many ways as an instrument for oppression. 
Secondly, uh, degrowth orientation is, of course, focused on decoupling economic uh, model from orientation on growth and profit accumulation that uh, contains also, which is actually in, in, a, in a one sort of revolutionary way, challenging uh, the current uh, uh, economy model and uh, putting it into real framework under the planetary boundaries and ecological limits of the planet or state or certain local environments. Thirdly, of course, feminist, where we can uh, we can uh, uh, use a socialist strategy to fight various uh, option, various versions of the patriarchy and other ways of oppression, and. Uh, base ecosocialist agenda in intersectionality that is often uh, somehow circumvented or by, uh, surpassed by, uh, by some of the even most successful leftist agendas uh, we experienced uh, in last decade in some of the countries. Internationalist, uh, it is of course important to, to find ways to uh, counter existing capital accumulation that goes beyond uh, nation states and beyond uh, uh, borders uh, and also uh, find ways to efficiently and successfully collaborate at international level uh, using, uh, using similar experiences, what of course left uh, very often does, but maybe the speed uh, of it, it's not always sufficient. Local, by local, of course, I, I mean that it has to somehow uh, be very much rooted into local realities, into needs of people that depending on certain natural resources or, uh, or public services uh, in their uh, neighborhood. Uh, and of course, very much needed to be embedded uh, into uh, uh, a community, uh, uh, community atmosphere and community needs. Uh, disobedient, uh, that mainly relates to the notion I mentioned earlier that most of these ag agendas and strategies have not been of very often proven to be, uh, uh, let's say, dangerous enough for the uh, capital capitalist objectives. And uh, in these ways, we, we should so somehow find ways to be creatively disobedient toward uh, the existing uh, uh, ways that capital is, uh, survive, capitalism is surviving. Uh, maybe even pandemic uh, situation is a very good example uh, how, uh, how that can be uh, explored. And uh, last but not least, uh, which apparently uh, is present in many of these debates, uh, although I don't often uh, see that anti-capitalism, like anti-attributes uh, are often useful to, uh, they don't necessarily uh, offer a new vision, but they are uh, mainly focused on the countering the existing uh, detrimental uh, uh, consequences. Still, uh, anti-capitalism should not be something that is uh, uh, shy, that we are shy and that we are uh, hiding, but uh, it can be a starting point to define uh, something, uh, uh, something new or at least uh, something that we uh, define as, as a, a real counter, uh, a real, real alternative to existing economic model that is uh, increasing social inequalities. Uh, I would uh, I would come back to the to the one uh, dimension I mentioned earlier uh, and uh, refer to Ugo Mattei, one of the uh, Italian lawyers and protagonists of the Italian referendum on water against water privatization, where I think that uh, the commons is a very important uh, uh, element of eco-socialist agenda can serve us uh, as, a, uh, as a constituent social power, uh, but we should not forget that we need those on the power to implement and commonize the state. 
uh, that can be done to some extent bottom up uh, from the street, from the movements. But very often we also need another uh, another direction where uh, where we need uh, to find ways how to commonize the state also uh, uh, through uh, 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 capillar uh, uh, approach, uh, bringing it down from uh, the level of the state once that left has this opportunity. Uh, I I uh, Satoko, how many? How much time I still have? Uh, four minutes more. Okay. I would like here to uh, mention maybe something that is maybe more on, in Europe and uh, in the US uh, currently uh, present in the uh, in the debate uh, on uh, that relates to climate emergency as a as a let's say a bigger or larger scheme of the uh, provi uh, allegedly providing uh, direction for ecological transition. Uh, we know it's mainly, uh, we call it Green New Deal or European Green Deal or New Deal uh, that uh, is now catching some of our attention uh, as a solution based more or less one decade framework to uh, to in introduce a systemic coherent approach by state uh, or states uh, to implement ecological transition on different levels. I, uh, although the, this direction is of course welcomed and to some extent and limited extent, it can ecologize uh, uh, economy to some extent, it can reduce to some extent CO2 emissions uh, I would say that uh, this model is still uh, far from what we could support as from the eco-socialist agenda, uh, as uh, the model itself is uh, very, very much focused on consumption. It is still very much focused on, even with ideas of circular economy, it is also very much uh, supporting consumption it is also uh, not challenging uh, fundamental uh, capitalist uh, relations uh, uh, in the capitalist model, and it is still far from being transformative. Uh, it is relying heavily on growth, uh, and it uh, involves only mere, uh, let's say, limited adaptations uh, that are not sufficiently uh, that are not sufficient to. Uh, uh, to transform the system. Uh, I would say that uh, that is still opportunity. This is still a sort of framework uh, toward which left can or needs to uh, relate uh, as uh, it, it can be also terrain to uh, demand or request a transition which has to be democratic popular and widely shared uh, and not to be reduced to financial uh, and technological uh, innovation uh, and measures. Uh, so I would say that in this case, uh, the left uh, and all those who are uh, protagonists of eco-socialist agenda could be watching with uh, uh, large attention toward the implementation of Green Deal and uh, uh, finding proper time and ways how to challenge uh, this model uh, 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 not to bring more damage, but also to uh, at least uh, find some entry points to, uh, to gain more uh, uh, popular support towards the ecological transition, having in mind both uh, uh, nature uh, slash environment and labor slash people uh, needs. I would like to end with uh, some open questions, which I find relevant uh, for us to uh, continue discussion when uh, discussing the content and the direction of eco-socialist eco strategies. And uh, that would be uh, on my side is uh, how to radicalize uh, narrative uh, 
uh, and gain more public attention uh, at the same time. Also very important is uh, that we all cope with this at the daily level is how to empower political forces behind that agenda. Uh, as very often uh, these political forces are in position to challenge uh, uh, to challenge and to induce systemic change, uh, but very often without sufficient political backup. And I would say most importantly is also how to tackle the issue of social reproduction, which is in deep crisis uh, as uh, a very, uh, uh, as a central point of eco-socialist strategy uh, that is very often uh, in difficulty to find ways to uh, offer regeneration uh, uh, because uh, capitalist change is uh, moving too fast and uh, social regeneration uh, is lacking sufficient time to find ways to regain itself and also find political equivalent uh, uh, able to, uh, to challenge uh, 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 capitalism in the long run. I would like to stop here and I remain uh, open for the questions in the later debate. Thank you very much, Ferdinand. Uh, that was um, very useful to hear the coherent the principles of socialist uh, strategies, which I find very corresponding to the, the socialist or uh, feminist Green New Deal vision. So let's build up. Uh, our final speaker is this session is Sean Sweeney. Sean is the director of the International Program for Labor, Climate and Environment of the City University of New York and the coordinator of the Trade Union for Energy Democracy to it as a global labor network that advocates for democratic control and the public and the social ownership of energy and the resource, energy resources. I clearly remember the two, that TUID is one of the first advocates in developing and the concept of energy democracy. Their work has contributed tremendously to construct and frame the debate and the praxis of just transition beyond trade union movements. He has published numerous papers and report constantly. Today's his talk is based on very relevant essay called The Final Conflict? Question. Socialism and the Climate Change. Sean pointed that the eco-socialist vision tend to oppose to the state being central to the transition to a post-capitalistic world. He argues that the radical democratization and the decentralization of the state it's far more conceivable. Sean, tell us more. All right, thanks, Satoko. Thanks uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity, um, which um, really appreciate um, being able to say a few words about this hugely important question. I've set my timer, so if it goes off, I'll know when to shut up. Um, my uh, talk is based really on, yes, the essay, The Final Conflict, socialism and climate change, where I tried to draw some theoretical conclusions of uh, in response to the climate challenge and what it means for socialists. I just want to touch on those briefly. But the kind of real title for my talk really is the technical is political. And um, I don't want to dwell too much on what I've called the limits of eco localism. Uh, and others have made good points. And there's also many strengths to local work and initiatives. But on the question of decarbonization, there are very serious technical challenges. I think that socialists must both recognize and try to understand. As a movement, we suffer from, as a socialist movement, but as a left generally, we suffer from a very high level of technical illiteracy. And I say that not with any um, aiming a criticism, uh, anybody because I would be the first to admit that I got into climate and uh, environmental work with unions and I, it took me a long time to realize 
how important the technical dimensions are, not just to the solutions, but also to our political opportunities. Um, there is a tendency, I think we're all aware of it, not just among socialists, but among the climate justice movement, the ecological movement. It's just almost a almost proud uh, uh, disassociation with technological questions, saying there are no technological fixes, social movements will drive the changes we need. There's no need to focus then too much on these discussions. Capitalism is the problem. Once we deal with that, then we can deal with the problems of climate. I'm being very um, caricaturing these arguments, of course, there's a lot of great thinking being done in this space. So I don't wanna um, misrepresent that thinking in any way. Um, but I think this kind of illiteracy, technical illiteracy is causing us serious problems in the here and now. And if we don't address this illiteracy, the problems are gonna grow. And I'd like to come in with some examples in a few moments. But first some sort of bigger picture theoretical questions. I think the point of departure for all socialists is that you know, capitalism and climate instability and ecological damage are basically inseparable. That it's almost impossible, in fact, it is impossible to imagine uh, dealing with those problems and still continuing with a capitalist system. We have seen, I think the biggest failure of capitalism has been the failure of ecological modernization. The idea that you can decouple energy inputs um, or you can reduce energy inputs while continuing with a trajectory of growth and expansion. I think we comrades are familiar with this argument, so I have no need to deal with it in detail, but there is a general sense that um, among, certainly amongst many environmentalists and, and I think some socialists as well, that the transition to a low carbon future is happening um, that it's maybe not going anywhere near as fast as it should, but our job is to make it more democratic, more just. This is a little bit more of a social democratic position, I would say, than a radical socialist position. But I think it's the data show and what we've tried to show with Chewed is the transition is absolutely not happening, that what we're seeing is an energy expansion with all forms of energy, including fossil fuels rising alongside um, alongside that expansion. So the growth in renewable energy, which is particularly strong in the OECD, is barely, barely um, in growing only incrementally in the face of this expansion. So that said, I think this requires, once we've accepted this, and not everybody does accept it, um, that the transition is not happening, then there's a need to say, well, what so would socialists do about it? And this is where I think we can counter the question of growth, of course, but we need to understand how, what kind of transformational strategies are needed to return things around. Also on the theoretical, one of the big pieces of socialist theory throughout history has been this idea of sort of stages of history that there's some, um, you know, debates, endless debates on the speed of transition or whether the working class is su sufficiently mature, whether, whether political economy is sufficiently developed. All of that changes in the context of climate change. It has compressed the historical time frame for a revolutionary uh, change. And that changes a lot. It certainly changes the reformism versus revolution debate, which I talk about in the article. It means that the minimum program that we would have called a minimum program years ago is actually revolutionary. It can't be anything but. And the other thing I think it does, which is sort of more germane to what I uh, want to talk about uh, in this contribution, is that the state has to be center of socialist theory and practice again. Many of us would like to forget the state. The comrade earlier today who spoke about Venezuela and, and I thought it was a very many useful insights there. Um, sort of the best of the best and the worst in, in the same sort of experience. And it's so ugly and messy sometimes that we just wanna turn away and, and be comfortable in a sort of a local space. And I think that's, we don't have an option with the climate crisis, but to 
acknowledge the problems of the state, but to take ownership of that history and to work on it theoretically and practically. But I'm not talking, I'm talking specifically about the ecological and the climate crisis. There are many things that can be done at the local level, um, which are, are fantastic and part of a new socialist future. I won't go into them now, that some of them are fairly obvious and have been discussed through this conference. So leaving the theoretical questions aside, I want to focus um, a little bit more on the technical questions. First of all, let's, and the, and the real political challenges that have surfaced, I think, in recent years around the narrative of the left. Let's take the Green New Deal. Many socialists identified with it um, as being put forward the challenge or the necessity to reach zero, net zero carbon emissions by, in some cases, 2030. This is not just the US, of course. It was part of the Corbyn debate. Um, it's, it's a global phenomenon, uh, particularly in the OECD. But we know where the ambition comes from, the idea that there is a need to have climate ambition that is consistent with the science, and that's the source of it. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the trajectory of 1.5 degrees and well below two degrees, um, very important in terms of shaping the politics. But what was clearly missing in the discussion is the how to implement that, how to reach that target. So we see a lot of pressure, political pressure on, in the case of the Labour Party, for example, the Labour Party was, took a very strong position on the speed of decarbonization, very ambitious approach. And we see targets and um, adopted everywhere with very little discussion on how to achieve them. So the IPCC, it's worth reminding ourselves, he says that reaching 1.5 is technically possible, but, and I quote here, would require rapid, far-reaching, unprecedented changes in all aspects of society, including transitions in land, energy, industry, buildings, transport, and city. So what we have there is really a sort of a challenge that there is enormous uh, technical um, uh, challenges to decarbonization. Let's focus a little bit on the 100% renewable energy. If we talk about the energy, electricity generation today, to turn that into 100% renewable energy is a massive challenge. It will take quite a long time. But then we're also talking about electrification of transport, of buildings, and food and agriculture, and other sectors. Now, Socialists tend to borrow from the narrative of the environmental movement and to some extent from, from uh, degrowth uh, literature uh, that we can do a lot to reduce energy demand. And that is absolutely true. But even the reduction of energy demand has many, many technical dimensions to it as well that we need to address. I don't have time to go into them, but I think they're important to acknowledge. The, so if ambition fixation or the overemphasis on ambition is one problem for the broad left, then the other problem is the idea that fossil fuels are bad and renewable energy is good. What this does, it basically makes, uh, leads to a form of ownership agnosticism. So we, at the level of day-to-day -day politics, we find a lot of people in the left say, oh, they want to oppose an incinerator or they want to impose um, a gas pipeline. So we must support that. And, oh, they want to build renewable energy or we must support that. And this I think is a real problem for a number, number of reasons. First of all, again, it sort of sidesteps some of the real pro technical problems of fossil fuel dependency, but it also means that our fight for public ownership of energy is weakened. Public energy gets associated with coal, gas, and nuclear because many of those systems were public, but the renewables sector is mostly private, profit-making. So therefore, the association is the private is better than the public. This is a very neoliberal ideological construct. And what it doesn't, it's very ahistorical because a lot of the energy systems were built before there was any real knowledge that there was a climate crisis. So I think it's deeply ideological. It's designed to undercut the state 
and it basically leaves no role for centralized systems to be converted through various means into um, horizontally decentralized systems or just basically modernized power uh, generation. So a couple of examples of this, uh, again, real life, you know, we've been struggling with a lot alongside TNI and others to, with uh, to defend public energy in South Africa, which is driven by coal. And we are virtually alone um, in, with the unions there in defending public energy. All of the environmental groups, almost without exception, support the privatization of public energy because they believe it will accelerate the um, onset of, of renewable energy, wind and solar. This is, I don't have time to go into details, this is a myth. Um, it will not accelerate. In fact, if anything, it will slow down for reasons we've explained in, in some of the work uh, TNI and TUED and AIDC have done on the context of, of uh, public energy. We also see another example in Mexico. We've got a government there which is reasserting the national public institutions, CFA and Pemex, and is making life difficult for renewables companies. Don't have time to go into detail except to say that this is basically responding to the neoliberal energy reform agenda, reasserting energy self-determination. But what do we see at the level of politics? We see the environmental groups have aligned themselves with US, Canadian and EU based multinationals in attempting to undermine the Morena government and its actions, citing the fact that all that Mexico wants to do is to return to fossil fuels and stop renewable energy. It's false. Um, that is not what's going on, um, or it's only at least only part of the story. So there's what very real political um, challenges that are, or rather political mistakes that are being made, not by socialists, but mostly by uh, the sort of the broader left who have this idea of have certain ideas from narratives of others. What's missing is our own narrative, a socialist narrative that can put forward a socialist energy vision, which pays attention to some of these technical questions. I'm just gonna check the time at the moment. Um, okay, so I've come to a third problem and this is the question of the sort of local solutions. And as I mentioned earlier, it's very easy to sort of, the state is messy, it's ugly, and we don't wanna deal with it. Sometimes surely solutions can be driven from the local level. But when it comes to energy and decarbonization, we can point to several examples that have, where this is basically confronted the technical limitations. One was Puerto Rico. Three years ago, the whole electricity system was wiped out by a hurricane. The many in the climate movement and the sort of um, other and others, even local community groups were saying, we can have a just recovery. All we need is the tools to develop our own electricity system. And it was, it was, it was a classic example of technical illiteracy um, being um, displayed by people who were absolutely fantastic organizers and activists, but really were unaware or seem to be unaware of the fact that 50,000 poles, uh, transmission poles needed to be replaced and the existing energy system could not just be wished away by even by a hurricane. And this of course has implications for the whole debates on energy sovereignty and the role of communities. We've seen the literature on energy democracy and we've contributed to it and contributed to those mistakes in Chuet, to be honest, where we believe that, you know, a lot of energy, so, you know, control and generation can be done within, say, the confines of a city or a neighborhood. And it's really just plainly untrue and it's, it cannot hold up to any serious scrutiny. This is... Um, Obviously, the movement of electrical power across large spaces is going to be absolutely essential if renewable energy is going to be the solution. It needs to move. It needs to be a part of a system. And that system needs to be controlled and owned publicly and democratized and restructured appropriately. And I just wanted to, as I'm assuming I'm getting close to time, I've kind of lost my um, watch here. 
Um, Satoko, can you help me with a time check here? Yes, my clock says uh, another three and a half minutes. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually on time then. So I think, you know, just to share some of the debates going on among engineers and scientists, and many of us in the left, many socialists are not engineers and scientists, but we should, certainly should provide a welcoming space for any engineer or scientist or people who have technical knowledge to be part of our movement, because we're really going to need them. Uh, both now and in the future to address this weakness that we all suffer from. Um, for example, even scientists and engineers who support decarbonization and really understand the challenge of climate change don't agree on 100% renewable energy and how it will be achieved. Some talk about the need for massive levels of energy storage in order to offset the problems that come from variable renewable energy when the sun goes down and the wind stops blowing this is not a small problem it can't be wished away some talk about oh storage is going to have such a huge ecological uh, footprint and and um, have many other problems that come with it that we need just a massive grid so the more wind and solar we have installed the more we can counter these problems of variability and then very few people in the left have said, well, what does that mean? And, and it, we're just beginning to get into these discussions. What does it mean to have massive amounts of wind and solar deployed in order to compensate for variability? This is a technical question with enormous political implications, certainly implications for how we discuss local action and what cities can do, what, uh, what even small countries can do. Where, uh, many of them are energy independent and it played out with the Labour Party discussion that uh, Chu Ed was very involved with, with our comrades in the unions, where the advocates of community energy, for example, somehow convinced the, um, the shadow minister and, and others um, in, the, in the Corbyn's team that they, the problems of variability were not very serious and that we could do a lot of community energy and distributed generation, and that would solve the problem. Um, I, again, I'm caricaturing the position. There's a lot of good thinking done in that work, but we put forward the view to Ed that we needed a comprehensive reclaiming of the energy system, generation, transmission, distribution, supply, technologies, all needed to be brought back into public ownership. And, and our view of energy democracy is shaped by that idea that democracy must take place at all levels it cannot be tied to a commodified electricity system where communities sell electricity to make some money. That's not going to be part of the solution. In fact, it contributes in some ways to the problem. So last points, the discussions that we need to have on socialist energy transition, decarbonization, our approach to, um, to responding to this greatest failure of capitalism, must have a very strong technical dimension. Whether we like it or not, it will involve the state. It must involve the state. It will also require that we understand that climate ambition is not radicalism, um, that fossil fuels are going to be needed for the foreseeable future, and we're going to need to plan our transition out of that. So part of uh, getting away from capitalism is a struggle for our own technical credibility. We saw in the debates in the US with the Green New Deal how, quite frankly, the right wing, the pro fossil fuel uh, uh, groups in the US wiped the floor with, um, with the left on this question because it raised issues that the left couldn't answer. Not all of those people in the left are socialists, but many of them were. And I feel that we have to acknowledge this, um, this problem and we need to try to address it collectively put more time, more resources into it. And, and um, so that I think is um, where unions come in in a very important way because they often are part of this system and they understand some of those technical challenges. And, but I think if we rise to the occasion and we understand some of the theoretical um, reconfigurations that need to go on in, the, in socialist thinking, I think it reasserts the need for planning of economic democracy in ways that are very 
new, exciting, and also inspiring for a lot of a new generation of socialists who are coming in to this debate around um, ecological uh, crisis and how to get out of it. So thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you, Sean. Well, that's uh, really uh, brilliant. I really understand what you mean, the, the, tech, uh, the uh, how do you say, technical is uh, political because the, the, the required change is so massive and need to be revolutionary. So this, uh, that's what you mean in the essay. I, I got more uh, the real sense uh, on that. And thanks to also uh, the Lala and Betla. So now I would like to invite invite all, all um, the conference panelists uh, uh, to to open to the questions and your comment. So you can raise hands uh, the physically, uh, but uh, turning on the video or uh, the uh, raise question your hand mark, please. Okay, I see Daniel and I see Hillary too. All right. Okay, Daniel, please. Sí, voy a hablar en español. Y tengo okay, mil preguntas, I'll speak in Spanish. I have a thousand questions, but because of time limits, cansado, and I know that everybody's tired, I'm all alone to make one. Pedra. And that's for Pedro. Eh, yo vengo de un país del I sur, come from a country a of the South, mucho and it was difficult for me entender todo to el understand de la the whole meaning de growth, of the de word degrowth. Y esto tiene que ver con las condiciones and this has to do with the conditions in which the majority of the population of the global eh, south, o, o uh, the conditions in which we live or they live, I live in Europe. Sé que en los Balcanes I know no that in the Balkans, they don't have this problem because fortunately the word no degrowth does not translate literally decrecimiento, as decrecimiento. My question for Bedran is how to understand to the populations of the South the concept of degrowth so that it's understood not as something that's going to affect the quality of life of those who already live poorly, but eh, how to, idea de, but de that will combine the idea of growth, of degrowth, with maintaining or improving to the extent it's possible the living conditions of the people who are not living well in the framework of growth. Yes, thank you, Daniel, for this question. It comes quite often. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, I would start with what you already, f um, what is probably most famili familiar with you is that I would say that uh, movements like uh, Buen Vivir, uh, who are present, which are present uh, in Latin America, are uh, already quite close to to the uh, ideas and values uh, which are presented uh, under the degrowth movement in maybe in Europe, to put it like that. Uh, and uh, of course, there is always this uh, fear of. Uh, sort of, I, I, I often uh, say it in a joke, it's a kind of uh, austerity, uh, uh, austerity measure, which is in a negative way, in a pejorative way, perceived as a component of degrowth, that there will be a sort of sacrifice uh, and that there will be a sort of shortage or lack of abundance, uh, which is then uh, affiliated to the notion of degrowth. Uh, however, contrary, uh, just contrary, uh, the, the linguistic term uh, is, I would say, uh, flexible enough to find other uh, equivalents to describe the effort that would aim to uh, find the basis for economy that would not be uh, growth oriented and that would uh, that would find uh, its let's say a sort of balance uh, uh, keeping it under uh, under the uh, beyond the GDP uh, priorities GDP accumulation priorities and also under the ecological limits uh, and there are also uh, more and more, more uh, serious efforts uh, by some economists to also to visualize uh, and to present 
uh, I would refer to primarily maybe to Kate Roberts, Donut Economy, uh, but also a few others who are uh, aiming to uh, demonstrate uh, that uh, the uh, economic performances can be uh, uh, can be situated and located within the ecological limits uh, and uh, without uh, uh, necessary uh, growth priority. And when something like that is present and can be demonstrated, then it's also much easier to opt for it and to advocate uh, such a model. I, uh, on the linguistic side, uh, I'm not a Spanish speaker, unfortunately, but uh, a sort of uh, uh, translation uh, of this concept could be quite flexible. Uh, as you mentioned, in Croatia, we, we uh, and in this part of the Balkans, we have been free enough to find uh, ways that uh, we translate degrowth as a sort of maturation uh, or being adult or being mature, uh, meaning uh, that uh, one, one society is able to find its future and economic future within the uh, planetary bond boundaries and within the ecological limits of its ecosystem. Great, thank you, Bedran. Uh, I hear you still, you're on, please. Yeah, no, so that was a brilliant session, as all the sessions have been. Uh, I'll be speaking in English, so thanks to the translators. Um, and so my, my question, in a way, it's to Sean, and it's a comment as well as a question, because I thought your contribution was really particularly challenging as well as, as very brilliant. And I think it's to do with this question of, of that how we achieve state ownership, and I agree about the importance of the state, how we, um, how we occupy the state, how we use the state, how we transform the state, combining that with, with some notion of democratization and commonization. And I think this is where the trade unions are so key, and this needs a bit further in-depth discussion, which obviously, um, Sean particularly, and Leila, you can provide. Um, because sometimes democratization is um, equated with, with local. So there's this slight counterposition of local and state. And I think what the, the in a way, the importance of the trade unions is that, that they are an actor, a, a potential actor for democratization, which is not so much to do with decentralization, but is to do with a different source of power. I mean, if you ask the question, how is it that social democratic governments, you know, with good intentions, even the more left social democratic governments, have always failed to actually transform industry. Sometimes they've taken over, like in Britain in 1945, they've taken over um, public utilities, but they've never democratized it. In the end, it's because they've always relied on management as their source of knowledge and capacity. So they've always kept in place the existing power relations of an industry. And so that's where one's got to recognize that the unions as workers, the workers on whom the company depends, they've got that knowledge, that capacity that can be a source of power for change. And in that, um, the, if we're thinking about the situation now, and particularly in a context where the unions are weak, but yet still have some strength. I mean, going back to what Fran Fox Piven said about the logistics of contemporary capitalism and the way in which, you know, the, the sense in which that certain unions, certain workers have got key strategic strength. And I think you can see this now as, for example, the aerospace industry, a highly, you know, um, polluting industry carbon intensive, is now having to restructure itself in the face of, of the impact of COVID. Now, it can get rid of most of its workers, you know, and it will, and it is trying to, but it depends on its scientific um, and research workers in order to, to make that transformation. And in many countries, certainly in the UK, those scientific workers are often the most radical. <clears throat> and the ones who now, in the context of 
strategy and what's to be done to save jobs, they're open to, to, to work with, with social, eco-socialists, as probably you know, Sean. And I'm just wondering how we can adapt this idea that, again, Fran referred to from the US, of bargaining for the common good, how we can adapt that which is an idea that's come mainly from the public sector, from trade, from teachers and nurses, but how that could be part of the um, trade union movement in the manufacturing sector, for example, in aerospace, <clears throat> to use their knowledge to um, be part of a green transition. So how do we democratise in a way which builds on, on trade union power? Um, and I, there must be experiences that TUED has had. Thank you, Harry. I also want to add uh, the, another question from the participants may, uh, the in relate to that, how to democratize unions. So I think this is also a big question, particularly to Laura, Alala. So maybe Laura and, uh, and Sean, please uh, the, try to respond to, to Harry's questions. John, do you want to go first? You, okay. you raised the issue of democracy of unions, so I think you should probably answer it. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think in this regard, social movements have practically um, saved unions, uh, saved the legitimacy of unions. I think uh, the social movements in Colombia have contributed a lot to um, a culture of listening and coalition forming and collaboration um, that unions have had to accept and um, incorporate into their practice in order to remain uh, relevant in in the left. And that doesn't mean that there aren't still disagreements, um, pretty acute disagreements, for example, around fracking uh, between sections of unions and um, environmental movements. But also like within unions, there's disagreements about fracking as there is within USO. Um, but I think that um, I answered partially this question in, in the chat. I think that unions have to essentially uh, first continue to work in collaboration with these movements. And in Colombia, I gave the specific example of the Proceso de Comunidades Negras, PCN, which is the one of the black leadership social movements, national movements in, in Colombia, um, because it is, for example, in the case of mining often in the Pacific coast where uh, there are mega projects, hydroelectric dams, mining proposals, and a concentration of the armed conflict. And if unions aren't in constant dialogue with the uh, leaders of these territories that put their lives on the line every single day to confront extractivist uh, multinational logics then, um, or even state terrorism in, in Colombia, um, then I think unions are going to miss a big part of the conversation around uh, what it means to stand as unions in solidarity um, and as agents within the environmental movement. Um, and then, so obviously unionism needs to be anti-racist in that, in that regard with direct connections to the territories impacted. Um, I think as well, um, the example of CUT Colombia is interesting because it includes FECODE, which is the teachers union, and the teachers have had, um, I think, a, a, a great initiative in taking climate education as something that needs to happen, not just within schools, but within the unions. Um, and so I think that's been really interesting how unions within the national worker centers have um, wanted to do more environmental education within the unions um, outside of, you know, what, it, what their workplace uh, sort of day-to-day -day responsibilities are. Um, and then, you know, the energy sector traditionally has been uh, male dominated. And I think that the example of ESME of the electrical workers in Mexico is beautiful because when the state uh, rampaged their headquarters uh, through a military mission <laughs> um, and fired 16,000 workers, um, 14,000 of which then entered a strike. Um, it was it was the women in the union and also the compañeras of these workers that 
resisted first, that did a hunger strike in the Zócalo and that held high the flag of resistance um, to what was unabashedly an attempt to destroy a key energy sector that was unionized and militant. Um, so I think, <laughs> I think these, uh, these sort of internal democratizing, you know, fighting back against uh, machismo and, and recognizing the leadership of women that have always been there is important. It, you, you don't need me <laughs> to share that in uh, union conferences. It's mostly men and that it's, um, you know, I think that that culture needs to change. Um, and then I think basically that the, well, I'll just leave it there. There's a lot to say on this topic and I would love to hear the input of, of um, the audience as well if they want to weigh in, but I'll just leave it there for now. Thanks, Lala. Sean, please. Um, yes, thanks. Um, I actually see a question by Harry Gregory. Um, does Sean support nationalizing fossil fuel extraction and and shutting down and transitioning to publicly owned renewable system? Could I take that question? I don't want to. I don't want to um, sidestep um, um, what Hillary was saying because I think that's there, but they are kind of connected in the sense. Yeah, that, please. I was yeah, uh, um, okay. planning to ask this question too. Please, uh, yeah, you can okay. combine. You know, the debate, here's an, I'll just again, I'll try to illustrate an example where the debate is in the US. And because of the contraction, well, there was two things that happened in oil and gas that are very significant. One is before COVID, there was a massive price war and an oversupply, which sent oil and gas prices down 50%. Then you had COVID. So then you had the contraction of demand. So you had um, a massive oversupply and very, very big slump in demand, which is only just beginning to go back to, uh, not even back to where it was. And it may not go back to where it was for a long time. This put the fracking companies, which is largely shale oil and shale gas, on the verge of bankruptcy. They were already in trouble with the, with the falling prices because of the price war between Saudi Arabia, Russia and the US. And now they're in a bigger crisis because of the collapse of demand. The refineries are nearly all in bankruptcy stage because there's basically no demand. So the throughput for crude to refine petroleum products has gone down dramatically. So why am I mentioning this? Because in the left in the US, it said, well, this is a great opportunity to nationalize the fossil fuel industry in order to shut it down. And I think it, but that's, let's get rid of it once and for all. That overlooked a little problem. That is the entire economy is built on fossil fuels. Take the transport sector, take the housing sector, take food and agriculture. So we may, may get into a situation where if nationalization was just about taking it over in order to close it down, then we got a situation we will be importing liquid fuels from other countries for the foreseeable future until we got away from fossil fuel dependency. So every car virtually on the road, every house that has a, uh, you know, a gas or oil heater, you name it, that would be a massive problem. So they, I think, again, a socialist solution would be, to this would be nationalize the fossil fuel sector, establish you know, a, a process of planning, of transitioning away from fossil fuels to, um, to uh, low carbon fuels, to not just focus on the power sector, but talk about how we decommodify energy in order to reduce demand, because that's gonna be without, th those two absolutely have to go together. Because if you're, if you're in a situation where you have to sell energy to get returns on investment, which is what commodification is all about, then you will, always be in a situation where there's going to be struggles for market share, there's going to be subsidies for everybody in order to keep them in business. And I think the nationalization option includes a decommodification agenda on a very big scale. But it comes back to, I think, the point Hillary made. The Central Electricity Generating Board, let me use that in the UK, right? I grew up with the Central Electricity Generating Board when I was a kid in England. It was a really well-run service, right? It focused on reduction in energy demand. It took coal fire 
state coal fire in homes where my dad, who was an ex miner who was dying, had to sit in a house with a coal fire right in the middle of the room, breathing in smoke. So they took all those out. They replaced them with storage heaters. They insulated every house that the public sector owned, the council houses. Where am I going with this? It means that there's such a thing as providing a public service for the public good. Is it democratic? Sometimes not that democratic, but it may not be the biggest problem in the world. What we do need is decisive action with the public good informing the debate. The I think the naive view of, of energy democracy is that we, we sit around and we talk about generating our own energy or trying to make things a little better here and there. And that's, a, I'm, again, I'm not being fair often to some of the advocates of energy democracy at the local level. But if you look at the literature on it, it's nearly all about process. You'll never, you'll never come across the word megawatt. It's so electricity doesn't exist in energy democracy. And I think that's a very serious problem because it says we can have control over something that we don't fully understand. And I think that's, that's something we have to address. So our formulation in CHUED, which has evolved over time, you know, we started with a pretty, I think, romantic view of it, is that democracy at all levels is what's important, at the level right up to the sort of parliamentary level, right back to the sort of regional level, democ democratic running of the public services, with workers on the board, which used to be a demand of the left years ago. And of course, yes, representatives from communities who they themselves need to be democratically elected because a lot of people in the NGO world are not democratically elected, but they have their own agenda on what they think energy democracy and decarbonization should look like. So I think public services are at the heart of this. They need to be versatile, modern, flexible, and they need to be aware of some of the challenges that we're gonna confront in the decarbonization period ahead if we ever get to that point where we can actually do something about this crisis. So stop there. Well, I think I would like to invite one more question uh, from Nick. Uh, that's maybe the last set round uh, before they're going to the, the closing uh, remark. I guess my question is around what seems to me a bit of a catch 22. Um, and it's that we know how, and one of the kind of themes of this conference is that has been, well, one of them has been that the, the left is in a fairly weak position right now. Um, and with climate change, we have a timeline, a very stressful timeline, because the more time we leave, the worse the climate crisis gets. Um, so if it's really hard already to even advance a kind of an investment in green infrastructure, um, how much harder is it to take on the much more thornier issues of power, which, which were kind of represented in your presentation, Sean, about the, the need to really look at ownership and in terms of veterans, in terms of like challenging ideas around consumption. Um, so I'm just wondering how do we, it seems to me that we have to make some with a timeline, we have to make some kind of accommodation with green capitalism, and yet we know that that's not the solution. So how do we, how do we square this impossible circle? I guess it's um, how do we how do we deal with this timeline? Um, are there ways to uh, accommodate to green capitalism in a way of going beyond it as well? And it seemed to me that at least the Green New Deal was attempting to do that in a certain way because. It was saying that market solutions aren't the answer and that we needed to move to a different approach. And to me, that at least seemed to be going in the right direction, even if we knew some of the issues. But I'd be interested to hear what you, how you think we can deal with the thornier political power issues while also dealing with a very stressful time. Super. I think this is going to be perfectly served as your last remarks, brief remarks, but it's very, very kind of a central question. Thank, and I give you three of you short last remarks, please. Okay, uh, I guess I probably start. Um, so, yes, I mean, I want to address the comment that was made about Colombia being the country with the largest number of union member assassinations and um, the impact that that has had on the labor union, on environmental activists. 
and on on militancy. I think Colombia currently is in a moment of a post um, uh, peace accord. Uh, where proposals, well, it's a little bit similar to Chile, you know, it's a moment where the country is putting forward um, with many frustrations and grievances, but putting forward um, proposals to transform society, to push back against OECD pressures, against U.S. militarizations, against um, multinational uh, um, mega projects and the privatization of key sectors. So I think it's, you know, to study the Colombian left in this moment of reorganization is, is really interesting. And then um, because my presentation focused mostly on unions, I just really, I want to give, uh, again, a shout out to all the social movements that have um, made it possible for unions imperfect um, as their uh, internal politics are to be at this position where they can be ha like organizing um, consistent, uh, and frequent discussions on energy transition demands. Um, and I think that Sensat is, is undoubtedly one of those organizations in Colombia, as is the Observatory for Environmental Conflicts, which is in the Institute of Environmental Studies in the National University. I also mentioned the Proceso de Comunidades Negras, the um, process of black communities. And um, I just wanna say, please everybody, keep an eye out for the presidency of Francia Marquez. She is a candidate that came from um, anti-mining black emancipatory struggles um, and is an incredibly powerful woman. Um, then the, all the lessons in militancy that the Creek and Onique have provided to movements. I also wanna highlight the work of Onergia, which is um, despite differences ultimately, in analysis, they are a cooperative of renewable energy um, that is making proposals for Latin America. And I think I really appreciate Tuad's work because it doesn't claim um, to have, you know, a silver bullet or the solution. It's, it's really, I mean, the left has to maintain this comradely culture of debate um, and, and uh, you know, strengthening one another from a point of, of difference um, and discussion. Um, and I also want to recommend, lastly, um, the University of Magdalena had a panel recently on energy transition in Colombia, and it is phenomenal. It, it, it uh, highlights trade union perspectives, um, electricity, carbon, petroleum, and I think, um, it, you know, for, for sort of greater in-depth uh, analysis of, of their positions as of now, and they are changing, um, I would recommend that. Uh, discussion. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think that it is not enough to fight for public energy. It has to be public energy with uh, certain, uh, with qualifiers or, or conditions or characteristics. Um, but ultimately, to uh, fight against private energy, uh, i.e. for um, a publicly controlled, democratically controlled, renewable energy transition that is phased and planned and that responds to the urgency and scale of this moment is the task at hand. And that obviously will uh, relate to other um, terrains of oppression, of inequalities, um, of COVID, of imperialism, of colonization. Um, and I think that the Global South has um, sort of um, has a lot to teach the Global North in this regard. That's it. Uh, okay, I would like to close maybe with uh, with the answer uh, uh, to question posed by Nick. Uh, I would say that uh, there are many controversies, uh, or if, if you want, ambivalences of. I think we can broadly call a green revolution uh, or uh, if you refer to green deal uh, and green capitalism uh, uh, these are one of the facets uh, we can discuss uh, and the main challenge is how to exit this vicious circle and where to enter it particularly regarding the time uh, 
the time the, the temporal dimension uh, is often here uh, I, I myself personally I was in Copenhagen in 2009 when uh, COP uh, has failed and I remember many of my friends and comrades activists were calling for an urgent action uh, at that moment now we are almost 12 years from that moment uh, urgency is again here and called from from the Fridays of fu for future or uh, I don't know extinction rebellion uh, and I can I always see uh, a very dual character uh, a nature of this call for urgency which can not only mobilize but it can also demotivate and paralyze as we can feel powerless that we don't have enough time to actually uh, build a, some sort of efficient and uh, 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 impactful uh, action. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, these short-term and long-term objectives are sometimes compatible, sometimes they are confronting. Uh, if you want to advocate degrowth, uh, you don't really have a lot of time for that, uh, particularly if it means that you want implement any of the policies which are, for example, present in the schemes like Green New Deal or European, I mean, European Green Deal in this case. So I would say that uh, in most practical terms, I would say that uh, I, I, would, I would say that you can, of course, embrace green capitalism schemes uh, such as European Green Deal, uh, but you also need to frame your expectations toward it, not to expect uh, revolution or broad social change that will diminish social inequalities. Uh, I think one can embrace it with, it, with its own limits, uh, mainly maybe on curb on reducing CO2 or uh, uh, reducing environmental footprint or carbon footprint. But uh, uh, it is challenging to to work on dismantling it while actually you want it to work at the same time if you want these policies to work then uh, in the short time you can maybe think in a long term that you have to dismantle them because they are again part of the same system and you we need to get rid of them but maybe at this moment partially they are working uh particularly in relation to to uh to climate uh to reduction of uh, emissions. But I also think that we have to always bear in mind that such a thing is not our political project. Maybe it's a short-term framework that can work for a while, but in the long term, uh, I, I would say this is something to be dismantled. Uh, and this is always the estimation uh, and particularly on the international level, it's extremely difficult to, to actually say when when one should stop and another should substitute it, uh, particularly as uh, ideas around degrowth are very often revolutionary on the paper, but uh, quite difficult to be implemented in a short time. John, your turn. Uh, just two sentences. I mean, comrades have been answered uh, or addressed a lot of the points, but. Yeah, I agree with Nick. Um, look, the Green New Deal discussion, it was was a big opening. It also has a, a, a dimension to it, which, you know, it connected the um, questions of climate change and the need for ambition and aggressive approach to decarbonization with the sort of the social and other uh, racial and other injustices that are, are so much part of the US and global society. So yes, a big opening. And we were at a point where we were beginning to say, so how do we achieve these targets? What needs to be done? What is the role of public energy? The Sanders campaign talked about all new renewable energy would be publicly owned and they would work with publicly owned utilities, presumably not the investor owned utilities, although that was a bit complicated how they would do that. But there was a beginning of a discussion on what how that could be implemented. And I think had Sanders got the nomination and the presidency or just as Cor if Corbyn had won the election, if, if, if we would be in a position now where we'd be confronting uh, this question of how to implement, which leads me to the second point, because we, we miss those moments, 
doesn't mean to say two, three years down the road, other moments are not going to present themselves. And we need to be, I think, just more aware of the questions of implementation at a very big level um, so that we can put to, you know, start to articulate and advocate for the kind of programs of transition that actually can address um, the climate crisis, to do it through a public goods approach, to challenge the idea that somebody should make money out of decarbonization. And I think that's the fun, one of the fundamental ideological challenges that we confront, that there's got to be some big bucks have got to be made from this. This is the Nick Stern, the green growth people talking. But I think we can do it, but we got to use the time we have in order to do to develop it and will it still be called capitalism at the end of the day i don't think it will be but you know we're we're we don't know what opportunities are going to present themselves in the next few years it could be a it could be a left a powerful left coming to power in a major country and that could change the dynamics in in if we are ready to um work on those those kind of challenges of implementation so i'll stop there and thank you all for this great conversation. Brilliant. I uh, thank you so much of all panelists, Laula, Lala, Bedran, and Sean uh, for participating in this amazing debate. But I really also want to thank all of you. I have seen the all really rich exchanges at the chat box, chat thread, and also brilliant questions I hoped I hope I could uh, pick up uh, substantially, although uh, although not everything, uh, the, but uh, your questions and exchanges have enriched this debate very much. Thank you so much. So you you all really helped to end this final session of the conference with the with the hope and with the challenge of in front of us, the evolutional challenge we are facing, and you we really, we are reminded um, all of us reminded with the sense of urgency. We need to keep working hard and united and strength, strengthen social alliance and social fabric to pursue eco-socialist strategies.